Welcome one, welcome all to episode 222 of the Xbox Expansion Pass recorded on Saturday, April 6th, 2022. I'm your host, Luke Lore, the Insipid Ghost, joined by my co-host, the Intrepid, Captain Logan. And in this episode, we are chatting about the impressive previews for Hellblade 2 Senua's Saga, as well as news of the Xbox Summer Showcase, which appears to be imminent in arriving, and Gears of War is back on the menu. As always, we hope you enjoy the show. Logan, we like to start the show by offering words of kindness to those who have made our gaming weeks better, but first, how are you, my friend? I am hanging in there. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in my life that's going on mm-hmm. that I will keep just personal for now, but, um, I am working through that and I hope everyone knows that it's okay to not be okay sometimes. But other than that, I'm doing good. This is going to be the positive or the positivity start to my weekend. I like it. I like it. It's a good attitude to have it. It, uh, can be difficult sometimes to deal with a number of different things, but I am uh, grateful to you for being here. Uh, especially knowing all the stuff that's going on. And I'm grateful to everybody else who's checking us out in our first live recording of XEP. An absolute honor and pleasure to have you guys here for uh, kind of our first foray into this. We made a big jump from Zencaster over on, into StreamYards. Uh, and I want to thank so many people in our Patreon community that kind of helped fund that. I used every single dollar for the last, like, goodness several months uh, from our patrons to make the jump to stream yards so that we could be here live, connect with more people, particularly as the social spaces uh, kind of are, are eroding. It's harder to connect with people. And so this is a pleasure should fix my lighting. I got so nervous and excited uh, today to, to hit the live button that I had to fix my lighting. There we go. Um, but yeah, chat with us, you know, in the live chat, it's great to see you guys. Uh, and here we go, man. Lots of good stuff. We are going to start off today, Logan, uh, the summer showcases, which happen every year. Uh, they've been changing as as E3 has faded away uh, in favor of ga- things like Summer Game Fest. Uh, typically, Xbox Fan Fest takes place there. The gaming space really figuring out the value of live service. Uh, not, pardon me, not live service, live showcases, figuring out the value of doing like a fan fest event being there on a floor versus just doing your own solo thing uh it's really we've seen a lot of different changes in that space and uh, according to the verge we have a potential date for this year's xbox showcase which for all intents and purposes is extremely important as they have been uh quite a bit in years past because xbox is seemingly on this precipice uh, it looks like Sunday, uh, June 9th is when it's rumored to be. And that's from The Verge. So it's not like it's just an offhand thrown out their number. But at the same time, we'll see. We don't have confirmation of that yet. But what I found most interesting about this, Logan, was we've got reports from multiple sources saying that Call of Duty Black Ops Gulf War would be on display there, which is a big deal because it would be showcased in the xbox showcase as opposed to years past where it's been in playstation uh indiana jones you could expect to see there avowed you could expect to see there uh flight sim 2024 you would expect to see there and kind of the rumor now from sources like jeff grubb tom henderson and uh special nick kind of are known and perhaps the word established is the right word there leakers of information uh suggest that a new gears of war game is going to be there as well. What was your take in seeing all of this news? And Chad, I invite you to say the same. I was uh, interested to see that this was something that was getting leaked. Um, I mean, we know that the coalition have been not only working with like Warner Brothers Studio on the Matrix demo for Unreal Engine Five. Uh, they did some play tests and some uh, some some experiments with Unreal Engine Five to try and like see what they could do. They're probably one of the strongest Unreal developers out there. Um, so to hear that they are starting to get ready to do some some announcements around Gear 6 is welcoming. I'm glad to know that they are looking to try and uh, and and make sure that, like, you know, we know that they're working on something if this is the case. Um, but I think a lot of people are interested to find out, like, where the story is going to go in Gears. Um, 
especially after five. I'd be very curious to understand like what they want to do. Are they going to continue the story in any way? Are they going to pick different characters? Are they going to try and go back to uh, what they used to? Um, I'm not a huge fan of these kind of rumors uh, compared to other ones, just because I think that this one is going to start to set expectations for uh, the game show. And and if, you know, if we've seen in the past when people start doing these kind of uh, these kind of rumors and, and leaks, um, it starts to kind of erode the the trust of the community for building something up that was never, never actually like planned or announced. And, you know, it feels like now people are going to be wondering why Xbox hasn't responded to the, the leaks. And it's like, that's not their job. Their job is to market it. They're, they're going to market it how they want. If people want to leak it, then that's, that's kind of nuts uh, that, that they would have to do that. But Oh, go ahead, jump in. Well, no, I'm, I'm thinking, first, I want to thank Nisa Hauer for being our first Super Chat in live XCP history. Thank you so much. Honored for the $2 Super Chat there. Uh, goodness gracious, that feels cool to see. Very cool to see <laughs> after making the jump over. So thank you. Um, I, I understand what you were saying because set expectations is a huge, huge thing. Having the appropriate level of expectations is masterfully important for both the those that are hosting the show, be it Xbox, PlayStation, EA, Activision, whatever it might be. But I think in this particular year, it is unsurprising that you would expect to see Indiana Jones launching this year, expect to see Avowed launching this year, expect to see Flight Sim launching this year uh, at a showcase, expect to see Call of Duty launching this year at a showcase. It makes good sense to see those titles there. By the time this showcase rolls around, if the date holds, and it logically would make sense to given the timing of Summer Game Fest and such, uh, we will have already seen Hellblade 2 arrive to market and be received by fans. And that the arrival of that game, to me, is a make-or-break moment for Xbox overall, given the receptions uh, of, of kind of 2023's outing, where they produced so many high-level exclusives that just didn't click right they were niche yeah. titles like age of empires uh forza redfall, motorsport and redfall Starfield. both forza motorsport and redfall had, i think had black eyes on them i i still hesitate for people that critique starfield it does not make sense to me the level of critique that game gets whereas dragon's dogma say no, doesn't I um i, I think I'm i know why <laughs> in a comparative way um yeah but but what i'm saying about expectations is a lot of these titles we expect to see at an xbox showcase rightfully so why wouldn't we see them at an xbox showcase um avowed and indiana jones and flight sim yeah. are the ones right call those, of duty as well yeah those those definitely make sense i i definitely agree that those are are kind of like known quantities and i would i would expect that those should be something that they expand upon on, on uh, showcase the call of duty black ops Gulf four is huge um i think a lot of people expect marketing through sony and i think a lot of people expect to have uh you know activision blizzard they would have done their own call of duty event to showcase like what the next game is and what's going to be involved with it it's interesting to to know that with this being an Xbox showcase, I wonder how much depth they're going to be able to go into like they typically do, because they generally don't give a whole lot of time to uh, games on like a showcase. Like you get maybe like a minute or two, um, unless it's like a, a like a, a one of those sizzle reels. Uh, but generally, you know, they save that kind of content for later on in the week um, in, in the summertime. And I'm wondering how they're going to navigate how they try and sell black ops when we've been with modern warfare for the last three years it's a good point um i think jam pack sam makes a good point in here just having cod in your showcase alone is kind of a, a huge moment uh in general just to see call of duty up there cod of course we'll talk about it a bit later in the show but reports that uh call of duty is getting more users than it did a year ago at this time, which is pretty substantial and crazy given that season three just arrived. Mobile is now integrated, uh, which I know I've been on a kick to talk to people about. Um, and people were lamenting what would happen to Call of Duty in the wake of Xbox arriving. So I think Black Ops Gulf War has a lot to prove. And 
when it comes to showcases, we had what a two hour showcase last year with the com- combination of Bethesda Starfield's uh, yeah. element there. Um, they now have an opportunity to do something similar with whatever it is that Activision is bringing to the table. And to my way of thinking, having Call of Duty kind of take the place of Starfield in this year's showcase might be a good idea because the entire time at the Xbox showcase, you have Call of Duty. There's a symmetry there. Uh, there's an element to it. Um, Bacon in chat saying having caught at the show will make it twice as viewed. Uh, I tend to agree with that. And Rick Davis, I haven't forgotten your comment. I'm going to get that in there. Yeah, I, I think that uh, it, a lot of eyes are going to be on there because a lot of Call of Duty fans want to know what's going on. Um, I think it's going to be really, really interesting to kind of see how they navigate that. I, I'm i almost kind of wondering if they're going to use the showcase as their way to announce this is when Call of Duty is going to be coming to Game Pass. Hmm. You mean like previous Call of Duties or future like Black Ops? I think like I think this is going to be a really good opportunity to really kind of solidify like, hey, Call of Duty Black Ops Gulf War is going to be day and date on Xbox Game Pass Ultimate. Mm-hmm. And if you want to play the latest and greatest Call of Duties, that's going to be on Xbox day one with your subscription. I I would have to think we get Game Pass on some level news. For yeah. sure, right? Has and Call of something. Duty has to be something, right? They are looking for ways to monetize Call of Duty in a different and new way because right now, to me, Call of Duty offers a tremendous value between campaign, multiplayer, zombies, mobile, battle royale. Like, that is a lot of places for you to interact and a lot of storefronts for you to get cosmetics and the like, Black Cell being the battle pass. And there's a lot of ways to monetize it. So seeing how Xbox chooses to navigate distributing that game, you know, to its subscribers, like, I think it should be in Game Pass Core, right? Like, just boom, everybody should have it. Everybody should have Call of Duty if you're on Xbox. Get them into that storefront. Get them into that ecosystem. You got to find ways to get people there uh, with the monetization. It'll be curious to see, at least to my way of thinking, what Black Ops go for offers different from Modern Warfare 3, which for all the lamentations and frustrations and people were mad at Call of Duty, it's at a better place than than it was a year ago at this time. It'll be really fascinating to see what Black Ops brings to the table. Uh, Ryan Tanzi in chat talking about how it's set in the 1990s, which is not so far back that you're getting like a World War II uh, or a, a, a Vietnam level distribution, like guns limited. Yeah. But you're not in modern warfare where you can have these fake fictitious guns and whatnot. To me, Call of Duty has gotten to a place where we are seeing integrations of Snoop Dogg and the boys and Godzilla. And it's, it's exhibiting this brand IP carryover that Fortnite and now Brawlhalla, which is I'm on a kick of and, uh, so many other games are are doing which is this cross pollination to watch how xbox navigates that with a new call of duty that is released under their brand will be really interesting because modern warfare 3 is an extension of 2 and i'm okay with that but it'll be interesting to watch yeah yeah and i think there's going to be a real a real interesting like road that they have to navigate or, or you know river that they have to navigate here when it comes to cosmetics, uh, you and I both just bought into the Black Cell content for Call of Duty Season 2. Is it, or, no, we're on 3. We're on Season 3 of Modern Warfare 3. 3, yes. So we just bought into 3. Mm-hmm. And honestly, I'm, I'm starting to think about like, okay, well, Black Ops dropped, or, you know, Modern Warfare dropped a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, connection between Black Ops when they made the switch to Modern Warfare 1. Mm-hmm. Modern Warfare 2 and Modern Warfare 3, not everything's going to carry over. They dropped DMZ and a lot of stuff was like, you know, part of DMZ and Warzone, Uh, Mm -hmm. you know, so I'm kind of wondering, like, how are they going to navigate the waters when it comes to cosmetics and uh, stuff that you purchase now for Gulf War? Are they taking that into account uh, when that kind of thing happens? Those are some of the questions that I'm curious about when when looking at like what are they going to showcase like are they just going to do a sizzle reel or are they going to dive into the weeds here like mm-hmm. you know, what are they how far how much detail can we really get this early on right no I, it's, it's a good point and 
I'm really interested because I remember uh, a generation and a half ago for Call of Duty Ghosts, and they showcased Ghost at the X. I want to say it was the Xbox showcase. It might have been PlayStation, but they went really in depth about having the dog with you and such and such. And people were not in it. I think people are into the multiplayer or the battle royale side. It'll be fascinating to see mm -hmm. uh, what happens there. And um, Ryan Tanzi in chat talking about Warzone Mobile uh, with its cross progression means that Black Ops will probably continue that. I love the cross progression. I loved that my cosmetics purchased in Modern Warfare 2 carry to 3. I love that when I log into mobile, I can see all of that stuff. I can see uh, all my Black Cell skins. I can see my Black Cell blueprints. I, I think that's hugely important to developing an ecosystem where people can access anywhere. And it feels very true to the Xbox vision of log in, there's your games. The promise of an Xbox handheld that so many people want delivered is there's your storefront, your cloud saves are there, your cross progression is there. Um, I truly think this is one way that they are trying to realize that vision. And I wonder how much Xbox influence exists there versus say just Activision was already doing that because it's how you make monies. Um, but I know that their engagement on mobile was a little bit lower for Warzone Mobile than it otherwise wanted to be. And so what they did, I think quite wisely, they released a $1, a $1 uh, skin pack on the Warzone Mobile storefront. It's $1, which means people are like, oh, I can spend money here fascinating i want to i'm just curious how these things go um and hey shout out to to cheeseworks in chat with uh complimenting the tales of iron interview that went up yesterday thank you so much cheeseworks very honored uh that you were able to check that one out rick davis reminding people to hit the like button really appreciate you guys being here for our first live show thank you uh really means a lot to us logan call of duty uh being a, a, at the showcase is not the only thing Gears of War also rumored to be there. Um, I ended up touching base with a few of the people that had inside knowledge because that's not our brand and, and, and butter. Um, whether it happens or not, I do feel like it's time for Gears of War. And my question is, uh, does do, do you expect a Gears of War 6 to launch in this generation? Yeah, yeah. I, I think they've been cooking for a while. They've had at least uh, the last good three years kind of to try and see what they can build. Um, I mean, it all kind of comes down to story, right? Like they got to have a good story to really kick off a gear six. Particularly after the ending of five. Yeah. So I, and, and I think that's, you know, that's going to be a big question in a lot of people's minds. So I think, you know, they want to get the story down. They're very proficient. Uh, obviously like the, the engineers over there have been working with unreal engine five. So I think a lot of assets can carry over from Unreal Engine 4 um, as they kind of like build up this game. Obviously, they're probably going to want to do a lot of stuff that's fresh uh, or really cool, you know, some some bombastic stuff. Um, but yeah, I can very easily see a game from them in the next four years if we're looking at like 2008 as or two, 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 oh my gosh, it's been it's 2028 in the future. Uh, I could very easily see like in the next four years, a gear six, um, especially if we're hearing, you know, the people who are, are leaked information, starting to pass this information on to other people. They're comfortable enough to say, like, this is a thing that is happening, which usually means where there's smoke, there's fire, as the saying goes. So there's a good chance that we will probably see this within this generation. Um, it may be at the tail end, but that's generally the best time to really be playing some of these games when the console is at, at its oldest and the games have been really kind of tested on the metal and been able to uh, to really take advantage of all of the, the specs there. I'm inclined to agree. Uh, I liked I liked uh, Rick Davis's comment here. He says, Gear 6 has to release this gen. It would be a huge L if not. Um, I very much think Gears of War is a pillar franchise to Microsoft. While I know that they have brought in a number of different acquisitions that allow multiple different games to now become pillars halo forza gears is no longer the only thing you've got call of duty you've got warcraft you've got elder scrolls uh in theory you have starfield i'm very fascinated to see how gears is received but one of the things that's consistently rumored in this 
kind of space that we're in is a PlayStation 5 Pro, the the jump to the next generation sooner than we would have expected. Sarah Bond making comments a few weeks back about having uh, the next most powerful leap in, in generational hardware. I think you need a game to showcase that. I know Suddy had a question for us uh, about like what it is you need to sell a PlayStation Pro or a Xbox Series Next, whatever it might be. Um, I think it's about a game. And what better game than Gears of War, which its legacy is setting is setting benchmarks on console space. I think that's a huge thing. And, and you know, I've got my Gears 5 console behind me because I truly love Gears of War. Um, I think we really need to see a return to form for Gears of War. Call it Gears of War, not Gears. I always disagreed with Rob Ferguson uh, about that a little bit. But call it Gears of War. Allow it to be a benchmark title that sets the standard for hardware, working in that Unreal Engine. Uh, and try to bring, pe bring people into the Xbox ecosystem that might have lapsed because Gears Tactics was amazing and slept on, and yet it's a tactics game. Gears 5 had that weird ending to an otherwise very good game, but it was wide linear. It wasn't quite sure the direction it wanted to go. Um, they have an opportunity with the next Gears of War, and whether we see it this year or not is fascinating, is, is going to be something to watch, but... Uh, I think that gears collection needs to happen first. I think it needs oh. to happen first. I think they need to do like a, now when you're talking about a gears collection, let's, let's kind of, I want to kind of expand upon that. Are you talking like one through three, like the, the Marcus Phoenix collection, or are we talking like one through five with like hive busters and stuff to like really kind of rand out the whole, the whole story of what's going on with gears of war. And also, yeah, the, the fact that we can't put gears of war, on on the title like there's a there's a cachet to the name that you have to respect and I, and as much as i like rod ferguson i think he's he's done a great job with diablo 4 that was a that was a real bad choice just call it gears of war everyone's going to keep calling it gears of war 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 never changes so mm -hmm. let's just keep it in there i think um well said i think <laughs> <laughs> i think as far as a collection goes the answer is that whatever this collection which we don't know exists, but we do know exists in some way, shape or form. It has to showcase the best of Unreal in its current form, right? Yeah. And much like Master Chief Collection, there's no reason you can't launch with a certain number of titles and then add to it. So one through three in Unreal Engine 5 would be a fantastic choice, a fantastic way to go. Uh, allow map integration and multiplayer because Gears 5 has has settled. There's no cross, like, like you're not... Uh, removing players from gears five in that sense so you allow a gears one through three collection with the expectations that judgment four and five could be added later for game pass ultimate members or at a ten dollar upgrade the way they did with halo reach there is a wonderful way of making use of a platform to bring in people to the gears franchise uh we had talked even about putting gears of war on playstation because we know that sea of thieves is this test bed for putting major pillar franchises. Oh, you, oh, oh I, mean, I love that you just like, like we, it's a little soon. Okay. It's a it's little a soon. Bed? How could it's it not a, be a test bed? No, I, Rush no, and, no, no, no. I agree. I agree with you. That is a hundred percent a test bed. Like rare or sea of thieves has always been the test bed for everything. It's a new IP. It's, it's easy to, to like it's teen rated. They throw it on game pass day one. They're like, Hey, we'll test the waters with the PlayStation thing. There's already some, some issues going on with the with the Sea of Thieves community and the PlayStation Five thing. Like it's a good thing that they threw this one to the uh, to the wolves to see like how it performs. But Gears of War is like, bro. I bought an Xbox 360 because of Gears of War. Like I, I that is just like it's ingrained in in the, the green blood running through my veins that it needs to stay on Xbox for a little bit longer. It's like Halo, man. Uh, you just don't give that up. You know, it's your your precious baby. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm projecting here, but I think I think that we need to get like the collection mm -hmm. kind of rounded out. Like if they're going to be doing a Gears collection, first off, let's get this thing on PC. Like we need to get all of Gears of War like working on PC and, and Game Club. Let's like, let's do that first. And then we'll worry about like where we can put this on other other platforms. 
I agree that it needs to stay on Xbox. I do agree with that. Uh, you know, on Xbox Cloud, like yes, that is where it needs to be for the time being. But there is a there is a time where Xbox hardware will no longer be it, or they double down and they go for it. That's right. I said double down. Why are what? you? What, what? Why are you speaking this into existence? Why is this like you're you're like like trying to sound the death knell for hardware? We saw Matt Piscatella report this week. I don't have it in front of me. We didn't put it in our notes. But even Major Nelson, longtime Xbox voice, commented they have known that the console market is not expanding to new gamers. They have known that for a decade. It's a finite amount. And so in order to allow your brand to exist, you must find new ways to reach your audiences. I am not even arguing it's the right thing to do. But what yeah. I'm saying is we have heard Phil Spencer, everybody's best friend in the gaming space and the Xbox space. He's my close personal friend, right? Hi, Daddy. Uh, yeah, it's so weird. <laughs> but we have heard him even kind of go corporate speak, go business speak, saying if we want to survive as a business, we need to exist elsewhere. And what Xbox platforms now exist elsewhere? Elder Scrolls, Diablo, World of Warcraft, Call of Duty, Sea of Thieves, Minecraft. These all exist in other spaces now. And if you look at tr the, the most played games, the most purchased games, both two different stats of numbers, yeah. those games are in categories for PC, for PlayStation, for Switch, and for Xbox. So there is something to it. I'm not arguing it has to be that. I'm not arguing the death toll of, of Xbox needs to be that hardware goes away. I don't want that. Right. I've got yeah. the Xbox One X right there, but it is an adapter die mentality. And I will shout out the nerd chats uh, comment right there. It is an adapt or die element. Yeah, I I, I don't want to I don't want to like portray the wrong perspective here. Like I'm fine if we have games going to other platforms in, in depending on what they are. Like I, I like that ex exclusivity does have to exist if you want to sell like a service like you can't have everything that everyone else has and have the same priced thing as everyone else and expect to grow your market that way there has to be a drive with uh, disney it was their back catalog and their library for disney plus for netflix it was their original shows for hulu it was uh, tv on demand you know there's there's Count things that counterpoint a lot yeah. of those original shows across a lot of those platforms were canceled after one to two seasons. Right. But they were still, it was still fresh content. Like they were, there was still like content that they were bringing. It was a reason to check it out. Like you, you mm -hmm. bought into it to check out that content, whether they decided uh, people decided to watch it was, you know, it's, that's how, that's how development works. That's how content creation works. Um, but like, I'm fine if, companies want to put their content other places it's the idea that getting rid of of dedicated hardware uh that like if if your consoles aren't selling there's two reasons either the console itself isn't good enough it's not it's not compelling enough hardware or the price isn't high or is too high you know it's not easy enough to get into the ecosystem uh or the content isn't compelling enough to drive you there and go ahead jump in that's, I think, the, the, the root problem of all of this, of all of this, and that is that Xbox's content has not been good enough to bring people into its hardware space. Starfield didn't do what it needed to do. It didn't deliver on its promise. Redfall, I think, has known issues. It launched too early. Forza Motorsport fell early. I'm going to sneeze, and that's a problem with live shows. So this is, yeah, so I... I, I'm I'm with you. Like they've they have not sold me on the promise of what I think the Xbox Series S and X were going to be. Like I think that they have failed me on what I was anticipating this generation to be, especially given the heel turn that they did on the Xbox One when they came out with Scorpio Edition. Like when they came out with the Xbox One X, they were like, We promise to have the best, most powerful system out there for you. And we're going to make sure that the games take advantage of it. And they were going to carry that into the series editions. And it doesn't feel like I've gotten those. And I think that we we really should jump into Hellblade because I think this is a perfect opportunity to kind of talk about like what Hellblade is trying to do, what Hellblade is trying to be 
for Xbox. And if this is going to be something that kind of starts to write the boat, you know, write the ship, get back on course. Before we do that, I think it's important that we take a moment to acknowledge those that have gotten us here as far as our Patreon members. Uh, yeah. We are so grateful to you guys. We've not read your, your shout outs for this week. Uh, we'd be honored if you consider supporting XEP, this is for all listeners, uh, with a like, a subscribe, uh, even help us keep the lights on and content coming by, co by becoming either a channel member or a patron at patreon.com slash Xbox slash Xbox expansion pass. And uh, we like to read our tier two and three shout outs and we will be spotlighting channel members as they arrive uh, when that time comes. But let's take a moment and read our Patreon supporters. Uh, Logan, it is your week to read, my friend. Thank you again to all of the folks that are here, as well as those that are supporting in any way that you can. For our tier two and tier three shout outs, we have Chris, 1H1D, Nicholas Johnson, Ellery Woods Parker III, Nicholas Downey, Rob Frawley II, Tao Zochi, Xbox Skittle, Matto 1606, Randall Thor 19, Silkenit, Rick Gaffney, African, aka Charles Jones, Game Positive, Jam Pack Sam, Matt Valdez, Neo Prime 33, Rick Davis, Red Beast, Xbox Mike 29, The Lord Sir Master James Suddy, Brendan Myers, aka The Winter Gamer, Sony's VP of Marketing, Kevin Butler, Clint Coombs, DJ Hero, and Dano 12. Thank you guys so much for your love, for your support. We really do appreciate it. Uh, any Anything that you can do to share or uh, help promote this makes a world of difference in the algorithms because to be perfectly honest, word of mouth is still stronger than social media. Mm -hmm. And it's much better coming from you than anything we can say. So thank you. Uh, let's give a shout out to Rick Davis, who just became our first channel member. Thank you, Rick Davis. You are appreciated. Thank you so much. Uh, that means the absolute world and you are double dipping on Patreon. So we really appreciate you there helping us, uh, keep the lights on and the content coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Logan, uh, you alluded to Hellblade 2, which of course has made the rounds this week as the first previews to Hellblade 2 arrived into kind of the social spaces and then uh impressed seemingly all arounds with just a touch of controversy as far as frames per second go uh hellblade 2 is running at 30 frames per second uh and yet senua saga seemed to impress polygon GameSpot, ign games radar and a number of other platforms that went hands-on uh i i uh, by the way it, it had to have been in our spam folder we must have missed it um so i'm really really honored uh to real quick to, to i can't believe it uh our second our second channel member oh, oh my nice. gosh thank you so much to spartan p four five four five one thank you for becoming a youtube channel member oh my goodness gracious this is incredible uh i am beyond honored thank you very much and oh my gosh nisa howard as well uh becoming a channel member i cannot believe it thank you guys Goodness gracious, uh, I'm I'm just so appreciative of all of you. Thank you. Wow. That really feels good. Cool. That That's feels really, really cool. good. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Um, goodness gracious. What a what a what a rush. So excited. I was so worried about going live, and here we are. <laughs> honored. 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 We're honored. doing it, baby. We're, We're doing live. It. Yeah, doing it on three channel members and a super chat already. I'm just I can't believe it. So Anyhow, uh, I want to say that 30 frames per second, a bummer and almost almost infuriating to see that the promise of this generation's hardware, be it PS5, be it Xbox Series SX, um, is at 30 frames. But at the uh, same time, I just don't care because I'm having a blast in, in the games that do run at 30 frames per second. And all of these outlets are reporting some incredible benchmark showcases for the Unreal Engine in Hellblade 2. And it feels like, and Logan, I want you to click on that link I gave you uh, in oh, the I notes. watched it. Um, there are some great comments coming from Games Radar, Polygon, IGN, GameSpot about just what this game will do. This yeah. might be Xbox's turning point moment that we had hoped, that we had hoped Halo Infinite and Starfield might have been, that we really thought could have been. Is it... I I hope so, dude. I really do hope so. Like, and and the, the, okay, 
I, I have to I have to get this out there because if I don't, there's going to be people who think like me that are going to be like, how come there isn't someone voicing my thoughts? There needs to be a 60, 60 frames mode. I'm sorry. There just needs to be. Um, there is, it's not even a question of like whether or not I think 60 frames is, is better than 30 frames or smoother or anything like that. It comes down to just an accessibility option. Like there is just a genuinely an accessibility function behind having higher frame rates to give people who have trouble with sight more time to be able to register the frames. That's just, it's, it, it genuinely is. It's not even like a, oh, well, you know, this is a, a thing. And I get the sentiment behind what they're saying here. The The marketing behind this is that it feels closer to 24 frames per second, which is a cinematic standard in film and that's what they're trying to convey with this game but that's 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 great but this isn't a movie this is a game we're playing a game and if you're going to play a game you have to take into account what players are going to be able to interact with like how they're going to be able to to interface with this game in 60 frames per second offers smoother smoother uh you know actual gameplay and that can that can help with people who have trouble with motion sickness if it's smoother it's a lot better to to kind of do so i have a lot of reasons why that personally i'm just selfish because i like having that nice smooth frame rate so not having that i think is a miss the fact that they won't make it an option bugs me and especially given that the game is uh a lower cost at 50 that it's only going to be, you know, between eight to, to eight to 12 hours uh, of gameplay. I get that they're shooting for fidelity and cinematic quality here. I appreciate that. That is their goal. But it again feels like there's another excuse why 60 frames isn't an option instead of the just like in, instead of like giving us an option for 60 frames. They're just saying we're not going to do 30. We're not going to do 60 frames. And it's like that that is not a problem for other companies why does this seem to be something that is plaguing a, an ecosystem that is the most powerful console or supposedly the most powerful console on the market i agree with you and i'm but i'm also yes the i think the big issue is that xbox has received repeatedly over the entirety of this generation and the latter portion of the xbox one generation talked about how its console was the world's most powerful. The Xbox One X was pretty darn incredible. I remember booting up Ghost Recon Wildlands on the Xbox One X Scorpio Edition. Still got it behind me. What up? And it was dope looking. It was incredible. And I remember getting the Xbox Series X, and it was this premium open-the-box experience next to the PS5, uh, which was like this like janky cardboard opening of it of whatnot. But then when I started playing my, my Series X, um, I didn't see any game that benchmarked it, that set a standard, that did what it needed to do until Hogwarts Legacy, until Jedi Survivor. Now, I was having a ball playing games. Don't misunderstand. These are two different conversations. I had a ball yeah. playing so many games. Forza yeah. still looked incredible, but it's like, can this be done other places? And it seems like if you want the premium experience consistently without fail, PC is the place to be. And a number of people go there, and that's why Xbox is there. Game Pass for PC, Windows Store. They want to bring in the Epic Game yeah. Store. That's totally a dig. They're not actually going to try and do that. Um, my point is, the console space, I think they have failed this generation to deliver what was promised. And it makes it hard to trust going forward. Thus, I go back to my original point, bringing back Gears of War. You need the game. The game needs to sell it. It cannot be the feature yes. on the box. The game, I want to see Gears 6 or Gears whatever. I want to see the next blank. I want to see Hellblade running at 60. I want to see it before you put it on your box and tell me. Um, and shout out to Court Lalonde in the chat, Matt Kennedy in the chat, Bacon still in the chat, Cheese rocking in here. It's so good to see you guys. Yeah, I I think that for me, it's it's painful because... The, the, every time this conversation comes up, everyone's like, well, that's what PC's for. And I appreciate that. I really do, because you're not wrong. If you want that bleeding edge quality, if you want to play Dragon's Dogma at 60, which looks great, by the way, uh, if you want to play Starfield at 60 frames per second, which looks great, by the way, buy a really expensive or make a really expensive PC that can handle that. And when you're looking at that, it's like, yeah, but 
I bought a console that was is the next generation and in the the gap between quality when it comes to PC and Xbox right now is is really big or consoles in general honestly like even PlayStation isn't able to handle kind of these kind of things and it, and it's really frustrating because I'm looking at it like consoles there's it's the disparage the, the disparity between PC and in, in, in the latest generation for consoles right now feels on par with the Switch and like Xbox Series and PlayStation 5 right now. And it's painful to, to watch because I'm like, clearly the games can do this. The, it's, it's not a question about whether or not the games can do this. It's 100% on whether or not these consoles can handle it. And it makes me wonder, what is the next generation of consoles going to look like? And if that's the case, are we going to see a bumping cost? Because clearly 500 is not enough to get a decent console uh, to, to run stuff at 60 frames per second at the fidelity that, that these developers want to push out. The, when I hear, like in the last two weeks, when I hear things like from Christopher Dring at gamesindustry.biz, who no one should be attacking for reporting, very silly on that one, saying developers are wondering why they make Xbox versions. Then I here within two days, Sarah Bond saying, we're making the next most powerful thing. Then I hear the Verve reporting on the Xbox showcase, which you, to go back to, Avowed, Indiana Jones, Call of Duty, all set to be on display. Microsoft Flight Sim, all on display. It makes sense. Like, okay, okay, okay. I'm getting a lot of mixed messaging here. And then I see Phil Spencer's Polygon interview where it's like, hey, we might go to Epic Game Store, which clearly is just a poke the bear, see, see what stirs type of comment um i really wonder if xbox has a direction if they have a direction for this next gen and i will tell you this wholeheartedly to the people uh listening live to the people listening uh on, on our podcast or wherever it is i don't care where and how they showcase their stuff as long as the games are good i want top-notch games halo infinite is in the best place it's ever been but it cannot have we cannot have another launch like that we cannot have another redfall style launch where redfall right now very playable very fun feels a lot more like dishonored than than you guys may realize but who's going back to that we cannot have another forza motorsport where it launches devoid of content too many games are falling into that trap of we're promising you this we'll get it to you later xbox cannot afford that in their current state so if you're going to talk to me new hardware Give me the reason to see that new hardware. Give me the game that needs that new hardware. If you're going to give me Gear 6, it better have a campaign, horde mode, and delivery of content with regularity ready to go for multiplayer. Cross-pollinate with your brands. Put some Gears armor in Call of Duty. Let Halo Infinite have some Marcus Phoenix armor. Put some Halo armor in Gear 6. We saw it happen with Gears 5, and then they backed off. You must, must, must give people a reason to play and it cannot be that the box says 4k 60 hell the ps5 box says 8k what what yeah what are you doing in what world in what world <laughs> i want good games i want to play them that's how you pe sell people consoles yeah i think um i think that that what what i would like to have focused on is in in court you know court actually brings up something uh, does 60 frames per second actually make it a better game? Xbox right now needs to put out good games first. They have stumbled so much to continue uh, to, and I'm trying to find the rest of it. Can't actually find the rest of it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I want to be clear. At first, Xbox had problems just having games. That was always the Xbox needs games. Where are the games? Now they have games. Now we've raised the bar. Now they've got games. Now we want good games. <laughs> now i'm i'm just saying like once we get to good games everyone that's like does 60 fps actually make the game better you're going to be with me when we finally get the good games and they're still running at 30 and you're like okay well now i want 60 frames per second because everyone else is going to be going to 60 frames and 120 at 1440p like the like the bar is going to continue to get raised on what xbox is uh accomplishing right now everyone's like between the uh 30s fine we just want good games, 60s where I want it, uh, even if it's, you know, even if it, it comes at a, at a graphical uh, sacrifice. And I, and I think that 
We just need to get to the point where we start to expect that 60 is an option. It doesn't have to be like, it doesn't need to be something where every game needs to be 60 frames per second. I'm not saying that every game needs to be 60 frames. There are some games that you can play at 30 frames. It's not going to make the game better. It's not going to make the game worse because of the type of gameplay it is. But if you're going to have an action game where you're moving around, 60 should be an option. I think 60 should be a standard. Like I I'm playing so so let's talk Dragon's Dogma for a moment. Yeah. This was on my game of the year list. It's in our show notes. I literally struck through it because I'm just so frustrated with some of the performance problems, even after the patch pawns and characters just plays great. You're playing on PC, correct? Yeah. Okay. Playing. So I'm playing on series X, the world's most powerful console. And like characters will fade in right next to me. Like they should have been there the whole time. Systems are overlapping and things aren't loading properly. And it's just like, come on, what are we doing? Like this very frustrating. I, I don't feel the need for a new Xbox. If these aren't, aren't delivering the best experiences. Similarly, I don't know that would a new Xbox fix the failure of optimization. I'm just interested. Uh, <laughs> Matt Kennedy saying, um, Luke is talking faster than I can type. He says, I'll wait for a game that will work perfectly at 30 frames per second, but 60 should be the standard. I think that's just it. Um, I think that's, that's just it. Yeah. Like 60 should be a standard, but I don't think it's going to be. And I will say, if developers don't want it to be and they can deliver me great games, fine. I really did have a blast in the strangely received Gotham Knights at 30 frames per second. I did enjoy Starfield at 30 frames per second, but it's immediately no noticeable when I jump to a game with 60 or even 120. Gears 5 runs at 120. Things a beauty. It's a beauty. It's yeah. a beauty. So I, I need it to be worth playing playing great games to get new hardware here's here's what's got to happen um and this is this is going to be like tinfoil hat this is how the industry works uh, moment for me so we need to get to a point where game streaming is so prolific that tv manufacturers are starting to get pressured by consumers for tvs that support you know, higher than 60 frames per second and have apps built in with automatic Bluetooth sync for controllers and stuff like that. They need to start shipping TVs with controllers for us to start getting to a point where manufacturers for consoles and developers are looking at where the standard is for the devices that are, are being that are that their games are being played on. They mm -hmm. have all those analytics right now. I promise you that a large portion of gamers are probably playing on TVs that are, are going to be 1080 still. Probably 1080, 60. They've probably got their plasma that they won't let die because they just they they spent the six grand on it back in 2010. And, and they're just and, and it's good enough. King from Iron Lords calling them the DCL gang. <laughs> Don't knock TCL. I was a broke, broke, broke for a while. That thing, <laughs> let me tell you something. That TCL got me through. All right. Yeah. It was a long time. Yeah, I still got I, I still got my old my old TV right here. It's still it's still got coax on the back of it. I still keep it for my for my uh, cyberpunk edition. But we we as an industry uh, and as consumers need to be pushing develop or pushing t like TV manufacturers to start upping what's possible on their TVs for us to start seeing where consoles or console growth is actually going to be warranted. Um, so that there's a reason to have stronger, powerful systems. Because I think at the end of the day, the console market has to shift from just one, one storefront to multiple storefronts. They need to start integrating things like Epic and Steam to draw in those other consumers that want games from other ecosystems without necessarily needing to buy multiple consoles. I think it's easy enough to sell one console. It's really hard to sell two consoles and it's almost impossible to sell three. I want to take a moment because I don't think my wife is in the chat, but because we're live and I'm sorry to derail, she knows that we're doing our first live episode. She texted me, uh, knees weak, palms are sweaty, vomit on the sweater already. And then she wrote, WebMD says you have cancer. And I was like, all right, thanks, honey. <laughs> thanks, baby. What? Appreciate you. Appreciate you. 
<laughs> I know, I know. Let's give a shout out to Silent Cipher with a $10 super chat. That's our second super chat in XEP history. Fantastic. Uh, Silent Cipher says, I think the key takeaway is to allow a couple different options for people to enjoy at 60 frames per second, slightly lower graphics, 30 frames per second, higher graphics, if the hardware isn't capable of delivering both. I agree. Options are the key. Silent Cipher is making a good point. Yes, fully agree uh, on that front. If, yeah. you, if you're if you going to have hardware uh, that is high power, but you have to make sacrifices here and there, I think that's normal and standard. Right, that is normal to do, but I do not like games launching without a performance mode or a prioritize frames, prioritize ray tracing, prioritize this. Um, and I'm saying that as an amateur because, like, some stuff my eyes aren't seeing, some stuff I don't care about. There are games I want the best visual graphics ever. There are others, give me them frames because I'm not very good at video games and I want to know. Yeah. I want to know what's happening. So I think there's a bit of 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 mix and match there. At least that's my my take on it there. But Silent Cypher, thank you for the $10 Super Chat. Means the absolute world. Um, and again, I'll shout out the channel members already. It's so cool. So cool. Can can I talk real quick about the the actual like previews that we saw for Hellblade 2? Please, yes. Okay, because I, I feel like we harbored so much. And, that, and I put I put myself to blame on that because I'm the I one do that blame you. really jumped on that. Um, seeing the previews come out for it, I was really impressed by what they came or what came across on there uh as far as like the combat and in the storytelling um it was really cool to see them talk about how uh, a lot of the animation is all mocap and they were able to really kind of break down the mocap so that it reacts in game based on the input and naturally shifts to uh, a recorded um capture that they used when uh, Senua is actually fighting. Mm -hmm. That's something that in, in most games, you usually have animation that's kind of keyed out. And you can use a lot of like mocap mo for like facial features and stuff or, or like general movements for like uh, cinematics and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's usually the, the most when that's kind of uh, utilized there. But um, to see them talk about how they they really wanted to use the natural motion of, of uh, the, the actress that's playing Senua and the the stunt actors who were playing the the enemies in this was really cool. It was it was really a unique take on this. Uh, the fidelity for this looks exceptional. It looks like it's going to be a stellar game. I think the eight to ten hours at fifty bucks is maybe a little bit higher. I think it probably would have you know if they could have shaved off ten bucks, it would have been really cool to see that. Um, we saw some games in the last few years that came out that had relatively you know high prices and the gameplay length is is not there um and it really does kind of depend on the story that they're telling there so i think that it's it's key to like let me to let people know like i'm okay if it's an eight to ten hour game mm -hmm. if the story warrants that mm -hmm. if, it, if it feels like they're dragging it on then yeah no i don't i don't want them to artificially inflate the game just because i'm spending a certain amount because that's not what everyone's going to be spending so I, I fully recognize to try and remove the cost out of that. Um, but it was interesting to see, like, this is going to be kind of like setting the stage for what I think a lot of Xbox fans want to see as far as quality. And um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think like the the like the, the quality of like what Xbox games could be on mm -hmm. our on, on the ecosystem. Right. Like this is an exclusive for us. So. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm curious like how people are going to react uh to to how to how this this works out. And and cheese works in, in chat says time does not equal cost. And and I I I disagree to an extent because I, I think that if I'm spending seventy dollars on a game and it's two hours worth of gameplay, that's gotta be some pretty amazing gameplay. And I and I think we tend to we we tend to like just assume like you know ten dollars for every uh every hour is is usually what i what i kind of like base my wallet on and i and not everyone is going to agree with that but at the end of the day everything is a monetary cost and i'm going to have to spend money on this and if i'm going to spend money on it i want to feel like i'm getting my value out of it mm -hmm. the quality of the game definitely impacts that and 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 reduces that 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 monetary cost in my mind 
Um, but time does to me, like I, I have a limited amount of time to play games. If I'm going to be spending a lot of money, I want to get a good quality out of that. I do not agree with you on, on parts of what you say. And I, I, all right. So I'm very torn, right? What sets a $25 experience that you get a ton out of versus a $70 experience that hugely disappoints? Um, is an open world, does that necessarily make a game better? Does being bigger make something better? Who, uh, I really have a lot of questions about pricing in games. And I was, again, fortunate, forgive the self plug, talking to the Tales of Iron developer yesterday, which you can find on the channel. The first Tales of Iron is an indie game that released at $25. That is, that is very expensive. That is very expensive. Uh, for a, a smaller platform indie game. At least it felt that way. And then I played Prince of Persia, Persia The Lost Crown. Somewhere roundabouts in that same space. To me, it's a game of the year contender, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as I kind of explore the mobile space, I'm finding premium games, which are very fleeting because the pricing structures are very different. We're watching Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3, which uh, Rick was pointing out in chat. Shorter experiences for the same cost, and yet that gives you avenues into other places. I do not necessarily think that shorter games should be cheaper or more expensive or anything there. I do think that pricing in and of itself is a fluid thing and messaging for that pricing is important. Is it worth it to pay $70 yeah. for a non-physical version of Hellblade 2? For the, for the record, physical is dead. Let it go. Um, and it's it's a shorter experience. I would say yes. I would say yes. Some mm -hmm. might not. Xbox clearly not confident in the pricing of the great game that they think they have, setting it at 50. So there's a lot of, to me, very mix and match elements there. And they are watching what Nintendo does, what the indie space does, what PlayStation does, what Steam does. Um, I mean, the solution, Logan, it's not a silver bullet because we always want silver bullets. Make a better game, make a great game, and people will show up, people will pay. Make a great game. And if you don't do that, it's very unlikely people will spend the money, whatever it is. Yeah. I think that's the I think that is the solution that too many Xbox content creators, too many fanboy style creators, too many people on socials refuse to say is that if you just make a better game, you're more likely to be successful. And that is a very, I don't think it's controversial, but like it, it's a weighted statement, right? Because what does it mean mm. a better game? But if I'm a developer hearing that, I'm like, hey, screw you, buddy. I'm trying. But yeah. if I'm a consumer, make a better game. People there's, show up. there's too many games out right now for, for us to be buying every single game. Um, every game that gets put out is, is got to be something that really accomplishes something whether in and, and it, and it could accomplish its goal but too many games right now are getting launched in beta stages where where people are getting day one patches that aren't even addressing like critical errors mm -hmm. we're seeing games come out where content is being held back for a month later season launch um the games just need to be good mm -hmm. and it, i agree the game cost doesn't always factor in when it's a game that you know is going to be amazing like i i bought diablo for collector's edition like you can kind of see it back here like i bought the the collector's junk for that game knowing that that game was going to be good being impressed with it when i got to actually play the beta i threw a bunch of money at that game um and because i knew it was going to be good so I'm very, very happy to spend lots of money on a game. Sea of Thieves usually pulls somewhere between one to three hundred dollars out of me every single year as a live service game because I love to support that game and I love the content that they put out and they get me every time. So it's it really depends on how much time I'm or how much enjoyment I'm getting from the game. If I'm not getting a lot of enjoyment, if the game's not long enough to warrant it, then I'm going to be left unsatisfied so that's where the game has to be in a very clean solid locked in state to really justify like are you worth buying right now or am i just going to wait until you get a sale cheese works in chat talking about hollow knight one of the best games ever made in their opinion is 15 dollars right now 
just like it was at launch. I've played Hollow Knight. I've beaten Hollow Knight. That's a great video game. $15. Are you kidding me? That is a great video game. Great yeah. video game. And the question of, okay, should it be priced more? Would people pay more? I don't know. Because I look at Prince of Persia Lost Crown. Fantastic video game. Uh, and price a little bit higher. Right? Yeah. Super Metroid was a full price game back when it launched. Right? Again, different climates for sure. But we have changed what our standards are uh, in that. And and just real quick, um, Rick Davis saying all kinds of weird stuff. Like, I get that he's a big supporter of the show, but Hollow Knight is one of the best Metroidvanias of all time. Luke is wrong when he says Ori, which is amazing, too. Um, Ori is better than Hollow Knight, objectively. It's just how it goes, man. It's just how it goes. It goes uh, Ori, Prince of Persia, Lost Crown, Super Metroid, flip them, depending on your mood, and then Hollow Knight. You know what I mean? Like that's how, that's the order that it goes. That's what I would say. That's what I would say. And I'm, you know, talking. The fact that you put Super Metroid over Metroid Dread is weird. I've never played Metroid Dread. Um, anxious to, in fact, I'm really excited for Switch 2. You're going to be anxious when you play that game, man. That thing's scary. Really? Well, oh, I, yeah. I, I will say, uh, talk about hardware. I really want Switch 2 to deliver on back compat and ecosystem. So like all my stuff that I purchased on Switch, which is a, Tremendous amount of stuff on Switch back when I was playing it. Um, it's an old system, you know. I want all that to carry over so that I can be a part of that ecosystem once again because I don't think Nintendo treats its fans really well right now. No. Um, and once they prove that they do, and of course we know that Halo Infinite multiplayer will be on Switch too, obvious. Um, then I'm back in and I've got a list of games I want to try, including Metroid Dread, which is probably the top yeah. of it. The top really of good it. game. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it. Um, Hollow Knight Silk Song, we it, it kind of came up. Uh, it got a store page put up on the Xbox store, which suggests yeah. that announcements are in, imminent. Um, I wonder if imminent means June 9th, like that showcase we talked about, or sooner, because it was very strange for it to arrive on April Fool's Day, but even Sarah Bond had to acknowledge on yeah. socials that it was real, which is just april fool's day is dumb it, um <laughs> it's run its course in a world of social medias knock it off you know uh but i i I, <laughs> I don't love it i think it's dumb i think i think april fool's day peaked a decade and a half ago when ign did the zelda movie and now that's like a mm. total realistic possibility and it's like all right cool um it's funny but for Hollow Knight Silk Song to be up after all this time, we know it's a day one Game Pass game, which is a really interesting thing financially. Uh, I think it's really cool. I think a lot of people are really ready for it, but it's kind of like, have we burned out the hype? Like, is the hype done? Have we burned up everything there? No, dude, no? I think it's I think it's it's an ember that's ready to get poked at this point. Um, we did see that it got raided in Korea as well, too. So, you know, like where there's smoke there's fire like i said earlier i uh i I'm, I'm i think it's really cool that you know xbox got a little like it's weird that they put up the store page and no one else has and it is super weird that it was on april fool's day shout out to turtle beach for making that kraken uh or making that um uh, uh like kind of a ship helm wheel attachment for their velocity uh racing gear um but i I think it's I think it's what people want, man. People have been asking for Silk Song for so long that I think as content creators, we're tired of hearing about it because it's the thing that everyone brings up alongside like a banjo kazooie game. But I'm sure like when it actually does launch, it is going to probably just blow minds and be up there for game of the year contender. I want so badly to see the comparisons between Lost Crown and hollow knight because they are both metroidvanias but really they shouldn't be compared right like it's kind of like when yeah. i compare hell divers and pal world like all right luke i'm just being silly because it's fun but uh it'll be fun to watch right it'll be fun to see like just how good is hollow knight because the longer you wait for a game that everybody wants the more the expectations go up and the easier it is to be disappointed but team cherry is great they're a great developer right so i'm really really interested uh to watch to watch Hollow Knight Silk Song arrive to see how closely their relationship with Xbox exists in their launch because they've been tied together kind of at the hip since inception, not inception, since uh, announcement. 
And how close is that relationship, if any? If any. Um, and I did seem to stir the pot by saying that Symphony of the Night is for nerds. Um, the joke being that I've never actually finished Symphony of the Night. It was in there. I saw it. I have 100, 101% of that game. It's amazing. That's cool. It, it doesn't it doesn't hold up the way I think it I think I don't think it holds up the way people prop it up it does. Uh, like people are propping it up. It doesn't stand on its own as as well as like some of the other Metroid. Like Metroidvanias have come a long freaking way people. It is thanks to Super Metroid and Castlevania Symphony of the Nights, but I think we can all agree that if you go back and play Symphony of the Nights, it feels it feels pretty sluggish. And that mm -hmm. is kind of the nature of that. But boy, you play like Ori or Hollow Knight or, or uh, uh, you know, Prince of Persia, like those games just feel smooth, man. Almost like they're in 60 frames per second or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Super Metroid holds up, though. I will say that. I will say it, that. that is, I, I do think Super Metroid holds up. God, that game is so good. But yeah. You no, know, we, need, we need to shout out. Um, oh my gosh. I can see it in my mind. It was an Xbox Live arcade game chat. Help me out. Uh, it was made by. Uh, it was made in Unreal, Epic I Games. No I what you're talking made about. It. it was a Metroidvania. It was so good. It was so good. It was it was like an Xbox Live Arcade, All like right. Shadow Complex. Thank you, Rick Davis. Thank you, Rick Davis. Shadow Complex. Thank you, Secret Friends Unite. Shadow Complex was amazing. Loved it. Loved it. So I never played there we go there. Yeah. Yep. 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 All right. You know what? Uh, I, you know what I do want to play though. What do you want to play? Star Wars Outlaws. Ooh, that oh, that game is coming this year. We had an inside source in our little gaming session last night. I know. We can't say it, but we know the release date of that game. It's wild. I'm looking That's forward wild. to that, man. Yeah, the trailer is dropping on April 9th at 9 a.m. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious to see where this, this shows up. Outlaws looks great. It's hard to imagine Star Wars Outlaws being better than Jedi Survivor and Jedi Fallen Order. I don't know, and man. yet, and yet, and yet. I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm there for it. I mean, I, I like BD, but dude, the little cat thing they got for this, like that, that's that's up my alley, man. I, I think that I think this game is going to be pretty cool. I'm I'm looking forward to this. I really want to watch this story story trailer. It, it, uh, it's on Tuesday. I I'm I don't I don't know. It's a trailer. What? Watching a trailer live is not something people need to do. I don't understand that part. <laughs> you don't need to do that. Um, I usually don't, but I mean, I am looking forward to watching this. I think it's going to be a really fun game. I hope that it's a really fun game. I think that they've got a fun sense of adventure that kind of parodies or not really parodies, but kind of like is on parallel with like what I expect out of like Indiana Jones or Uncharted, but in Star Wars. And I think that's really awesome. Agreed. Agreed. Um, Logan, I'm going to send or put into chat a not into chat into our notes, a comment that Sarah Bond made. Would you look into that for me while I talk about Star Wars Outlaws for me? Yeah, um, I'm really interested to see Ryan Tansy. I see your comment. That's what pointed me to it. Thank you. Um, I am really interested to watch the reception of Jedi uh, of Star Wars Outlaws because of the success of the Jedi Survivor series because of watching how Star Wars is changing overall with the Acolyte, with Ahsoka, really finding its new direction. By the way, anyone that's mad at still mad about Disney and Star Wars, you are off your rocker. We've gotten some of the best Star Wars around. Um, it is such a better thing than it than it once was. Um, the movies are painful to an extent, but the shows are so good. The shows are so good. The movies, I think, are being made better retroactively, which I grant you they're very out of sync. But like, <laughs> go look at the prequel trilogy. Go look at the prequel trilogy. Now, Rick uh, Davis saying there's too much. I can see that. We're, we're not quite at MCU level silliness, but but there is a lot. In the gaming space, though, I have loved the levels of experiment that they're showing between Star yeah. Wars Squadrons, which was really fun, but like I was done very quickly. Another Fallen uh, Order and Survivor. Yeah. great games um and outlaws looking to be a great game uh there's a lot of ways to expand a star wars universe and it not be too much and we'll see kind of how that goes but but nothing uh nothing yet is giving me pause because battlefront 2 ended up in a great space um but i will laugh wholeheartedly at the battlefront collection what a what an amusing disaster that was it's a shame too, right? Because there's a lot of love that that comes from there. 
like those games are really genuinely just really really fun um but that's it's it's a shame when it feels like uh it, it feels like they're the like the gaming industry is like a step behind movie industry right now like movie industry has already gone through the whole like let's make everything a remake let's remaster everything now they're just re-releasing movies that were good back in the day they're like hey you guys like aliens we're just going to throw it back in movie theaters you like the matrix we're just going to put it back in theaters you guys want to go watch it again we do, it's like what we're what are secondhand theaters now anymore if you if you don't have like the cheaper theaters to go to um but with games it's like we're still kind of at that phase where we're trying to like shove out old games on newer hardware to make sure that you know what what was really good is still accessible. And the article that just came out from Jez Gordon over at Windows, Windows Central uh, talks about like some of the emails that have uh, have been shared um, to them that have come from uh, Xbox president Sarah Bond, who've talked about how they are trying to build or they're building up a team that is going to dedicate uh, their, their, their lives basically to future proofing digital games in their libraries for future hardware, which not only kind of reassures that, uh, that that hardware will continue for Xbox, but that digital libraries and that ecosystem will be maintained. Something that we were just talking about with Switch too, and how some of the concerns of what Nintendo tends to do when they jump to a new console is sometimes they leave behind the past uh, to, to force people to rebuy all of their content. And the dedication from Xbox here is commendable because they're one of the few console manufacturers out there that are willing to not have to charge you for games that you already own just because they're upscaled or just because you've you've purchased them on past consoles like that is something really commendable so i really love this um the uh the the she says that in the emails uh reiterated michael microsoft's plans to build new xbox hardware focused on delivering the biggest technical leap ever in a generation that's what i'm talking about that's the kind of messaging that i think will sell consoles is where you are now needs to get so much closer to what pc is accomplishing out there to be able to deliver on the the things that pcs can do but still in a closed ecosystem for consoles where people don't have to think about oh, god are my drivers updated um, is Windows trying to do a security update right now? Do I have to install this storefront to be able to access this game? Like they just want to click a little Nexus button on their box, pick up a controller and enjoy the games. I uh, So I'll offer a counterpoint because I don't think I disagree with you, but we just talked not a, le or less than an hour ago about how features don't sell consoles. And I don't, like we've had the best in back compat for years on Xbox and it's not moved a needle. So this news is huge to me. I love back compat. I play old games. I thoroughly enjoy all these old games and Todd Oxtra making a good comment in, in chat saying licensing is the biggest challenge for game preservation. Yes, 100%. But now that they own Activision that frees up some of that stuff, they have a little more sway in the industry than they might've otherwise had. Um, but I really love what Xbox does feature wise, but I don't think that sells boxes. I just don't. I mean, it sold me. I got sold on, on the Xbox series X with back compat with, uh, the, the, um, Oh, smart delivery with, uh, oh, what's the game pausing thing that they call quicker zoom, quicker zoom. Yeah. Quicker zoom sold me. Dude, I was like, man, you can play one game and you pick up another one. And Alana Pierce is like, I unplugged my Xbox and I plugged it in somewhere else. And the game was still locked into where I was when I unplugged it. I was like, it but, blew well, my mind. Bar none, quick resume, cloud save, auto HDR, FPS boost, back and pat. They have done an incredible job with features. Yeah. With 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 features. And I will I dare say that the Xbox Series S and X consoles are the best designed Xboxes we have ever seen seen not just in form factor but in, in just design right the way they handle heating and, and everything else i look at that monstrosity of a ps5 which plays god of war and spider-man which i love so ugly but it looks ugly as sin so jason ronald and his team deserve all the compliments in the world i hope to one day shake his hand and talk to him but features and design don't sell consoles they just don't and that's the part that i get stuck on 
That's the part that I'm um, really stuck on. That said, if they're bringing back the back and pat program in some way, shape, or form, the sky's the limit, man. Now that they have Activision, like what happens to all those old Spider-Man games, right? Like yeah. the idea that those games can suddenly be played by a new audience. I say new in a relative term, but they can bring them back and, and the stranglehold isn't there because Sony is really screwing up the Spider-Man IP. I don't mean the games per se, though the ROI is low, but the Spider-Man IP is being wildly disrespected with movies like Morbius, Madam Web, Cra Craven, uh, really Sorry. mishandled. Those aren't Spider-Man movies, though. Oh, how you are wrong. And no, it, no, it's just consistently been mishandled. And, so, and you look at Spider-Man and Avengers, uh, which was a dud in every way, shape and form. They're really mishandling, I think, the character. So it'll be fascinating to see, like, does this program open up doors or it doesn't. And that's just Luke Lore's angle of approach on back compat because I am an IP focused person. You do love your IP. That's true. I do. I was I trying to make a, a joke about how uh, how those movies are all like really bad fanfic, um, and they're not actually tied to the uh, to the the Spider Man universe. Um, I while I don't disagree that features are not the main selling point of a console, because I do think that the games are what actually sells consoles. Um, it is important as an Xbox consumer that a lot of the features that are currently implemented on the hardware for today are something that are future or are, are pushed forward into future generations. Like I don't want to lose quick resume at the cost of some other thing in Xbox's hardware. Additionally, I think they need to take it a step further and really kind of expand upon, expand, expand upon some of the actual features that right now are actually lacking that could be improved on so like sharing uh clipping stuff like uh, like you can you can clip like an hour's worth of stuff on on an on a ps5 like that should be something i i should be able to do on xbox and i really want them to like continue to evolve the ecosystem because that's where i prefer my ecosystem to be um so i love that they are committing to uh, the largest technical leap with their next hardware. I love that they're committing to bringing forward the libraries and making sure that back and pat is available day one because it's it's just going to help enrich what already has been built up both with the Xbox One, now with the Xbox Series, whatever their next console's manufacturing line is called, it just is going to help kind of reaffirm the foundation of how good that console is going to be and if the if the hardware is there and it's doing what it says, everything that I've got now is just going to look and play better. I just hope that things like FPS boost and auto HDR are ways that are are, are attributed to series games now. So in the future, if we want to have Hellblade 2 send you a saga at 60 frames per second, the next console generation can take that game and use FPS boost to push us to have that 60 frames if that's what we want. And and I think that studios need to think about that as, a, as an option. That's fair. Now, your point is well taken, and I agree. Uh, it'll just be one of those things that's like, what are they willing to do? What can they afford to do R&D-wise yeah. and everything else? Because right now, Xbox is spread thin. And so the news of the Xbox handheld possibilities and such really make you wonder. They just make you wonder, you know? Yeah. Um. Quick, quick aside, shout out to the, the 20 plus people that have been hanging out with us so far. We really appreciate you guys uh, for being here, for, for being supportive. It, it means the world. Um, Logan, some of our smaller topics this week, uh, I think are really fun. First of all, in Halo Infinite, the yapping is happening. I jumped in to the horde mode. Uh, it was called Firefight in Halo Infinite, and it's all grunts. And because this is a big difference in like the Halo Infinite engine versus like older ones, there are so many grunts. It's wild. Uh, a, a fun thing, and I like when when shooters do these like limited time events. Like we are, we just played through a Hollow Earth MonsterVerse event, which was pretty lackluster, I think, in Call of Duty. But these little events to keep people engaged are fun. Um, I will tell anybody go check out the yapping uh, in Halo Infinite. It's funny. It's just there's just so many grunts, um, which is a good get, time. Can't get past that word, dude. 
The yapping is happening, the yapping, bro. What are yeah. you mad about? What are you, what are you mad about? Call it that. That sounds so dirty. Clearly, you don't know Yip Yap. Okay. Clearly, you don't know. I know Yip. yip you don't get get caught up on your Halo lore. Logan. Don't even, dude. <laughs> don't I, I've spent there. a large portion of my time in Halo Infinite standing next to those towers and just thinking about you know the day I'll get yeah, uh, Yip Yap's uh, autograph. Don't even. I don't know, man. I don't know. I, I, it's hard. It's hard here. Um, let's look at okay. So Call of Duty. We talked about Call of Duty growth. Activision did confirm in a statement to Forbes that Modern Warfare Three and Warzone player counts are now higher than they were last year. At this point, very curious to know if they're counting mobile in there, just because. Probably. But uh, it, it is neat to see. And as someone who enjoys cross progression and being able to play in one spot, jump over, have my content in another spot, I like that uh, a lot. Um, another smaller story here. And Logan, can you look up the Game Pass updates for me? I meant to link that and I forgot. Oh, to. yeah, I forgot to. I appreciate you, buddy. Um, Dragon's Dogma 2 hit 2.5 million units sold, which I think is a really successful outing for a game that, while in social spaces, might have felt like it was the next coming of Gaming Jesus. In fact, it was a niche title back in the day, including myself, 40 hours plus in that game, loved it, um, that arrived here at a time where I think a lot of the oxygen in the room was gobbled up by other things when when it arrived you have stellar blade which our community is effectively called bosom blade um which is funny in and of itself uh what's what's up fun speculation good shout out to mav good shout out to mav great to see you here man i'm, I'm taking a page from your book being live um but yeah seeing uh dragon's dog hit 2.5 million i like it i'm there for it I did bounce off of it and I didn't expect to. I think I'll go back to it this summer, but I need a few more quality of life updates there. Um, I'm really I'm really stoked uh, to see the Game Pass updates when you have those put yeah, in there. Yeah, I got them. Do you have them? Okay, cool, cool, yeah, cool. Yeah, all right. So things that just came to Game Pass, uh, Lego 2K Drive, pretty decent. Little Gator Game is one that I want to check out because a uh, friend of the show and and good guy all around, Super Pack CJ Chris Johnston, uh, Player One Podcast, recommended this as a Zelda like. And honestly, Zelda likes are are tend to be pretty good because the passion's usually there. You know, we got a uh, Tunic not too long ago. Uh, mm -hmm. Blossom Tales a fantastic Zelda like. Um, there's been a, a lot of good ones out there that are not actually Zelda games, but like kind of retro version of, of Zelda's, but with a new IP. So I'm, I'm definitely going to check out little Gator game. We also got EA sports PGA tour, which, uh, it's golf. If you like golf, definitely fun. You know, there's it's golf, uh, Kona came out. We also got botany manor, which I took a look at. It looks, it's weird, but. You know, that's the fun of indie is you get weird, you get new ideas. Mm -hmm. We also got Shadow of the Tomb Raider Definitive Edition, which I need great to get game. through. Yeah, I, 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 need, I need to go need back to, go. to it, but it is a great game. I need to go play through the actual Tomb Raider games because that's one where it's like I'm I'm still I still they haven't gone them. to. Yeah, and uh, they look great on Xbox, too, man. They actually, you know, they did a good job with the back. Mm -hmm. And then Harold Halibut, which I'm not familiar with. So I. Uh, no, no big questions on that one, please. X Xbox era is talking up Harold, Harold Halibut a lot. Um, and I am looking, I've had a lot of people ask if I could get the developer on the show. That's the game that's like stop motion with the art style. They're doing a stop motion art style. Interesting okay. is the right word. I don't know how I feel about it. Um, but I know Xbox era is very high on it. And it's, it seems to be tan like anecdotally important to the Xbox community. So, Okay. Oh, okay. I'm looking at I'm looking at some images of this now. I'm I'm not gonna watch a video. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be a hundred percent honest with you. There's something about stop motion that creeps me out. I don't like watching stop motion. It, mm. And as someone who has an animation degree, like I have an associates in, in 2D and 3D occupational animation from from way back in the day. Like I understand how animation works. Mm-hmm there's something weird about stop motion animation like this that just I, it messes it 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 feels it feels weird settling <laughs> i get that i have that with the, the tim burton anything except for yes. batman tim burton anything really bothers me um and it's not a matter of quality or anything else it's just it's a little odd yeah. um for sure and there's the new xbox game which for the life of me i can't remember state of uh, i can't remember um it's not state of decay, but it, it's it looks like it's partially stop motion, which I'm really interested in. It, it looks really cool. 
um, mm-hmm. in that like Southern Louisiana vibe. Let's oh, go. Um, no, hold South on. Of midnight. South of Midnight. That's it. That's Logan, it. look at this. The Lord Sir Master James Suddy, the all father, the purveyor of family values, dropping a $20 super chat in there. Thank you so much. He says, just doing that thing Luke didn't want to guilt me into. Great job, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really told him not to do anything because I knew he would try to. And then, then one fun speculation Mav dropping in here with a five dollar super chat as well saying awesome to see the show live thank you so much goodness gracious those mean the absolute world i i was so nervous about taking the show live seeing you guys all turn up be supportive just an absolute joy to see shut up here comes silence oh cypher now dropping some <laughs> love gifting five xep memberships Goodness gracious, guys. I can't say enough thank yous out there. Uh, Silent Cypher gifting Drake Williams, Sabarito, Mean Muggin 20, and Matt Sarian. Thank you guys so much. I cannot believe how well this is going. I am just so honored uh, to have you guys here. So thank you. I'm going to need to update that ticker uh, for sure with the channel memberships. Give me a bit. I'll do that when Logan's, uh, chatting in a minute, but thank you guys so much for your support. So, God, kind. so kind, so kind and really, really, really helpful there. Um, yeah, so, to go back to the point South of midnight, very interested to see, uh, more about that game. I hope we see that at the showcase because yeah. it is one of those, those games like, uh, that has that kind of neat, interesting art it's style. Unique. Yeah. It's unique. Very it's much unique. So. It looks great. Like South of Midnight looks amazing. Like I, I fully, I fully accept that. Like that is a game that I will play because it just, it look, it compels me as an artistic like piece mm-hmm. um, similar to, to Hellblade. Like those are games that I'm going to play because of, of the art that's being driven behind them um whether you know they're 30 frames or 60 frames or stop motion or or whatever you know i will i will probably jump into those because i i'm very curious to see like what that it's it's like a psychonauts too like i couldn't get past the teeth thing in in psychonauts because i've got my own issues but there i recognize the the artistic prowess of these studios and what they're driving towards so i'm really cool i, I think it's really cool to see like that happening at an indie level as well too um with with the the herald uh herald halibut i just i i have such a hard time getting past certain things i it's like tryptophobia like trip like i have tryptophobia it it messes with me i can't watch it or like uh what it was like medical things where they like do like surgical insertions and such like there's certain things and you got to know these about yourself so if you know them then you know what i'm talking about sure. but there's a hundred percent things that will just trigger a sense in your mind that makes you feel weird or queasy. Mm-hmm. Stop motion, unfortunately, is one of those things that just feels unsettling to me. There's like Kubo in, oh, I can't remember what the, the movie Kubo's name was, or like the full name, but that was a fantastic movie. Course Right, fantastic movie. I love those movies, yeah. but they feel weird. And That's this fair. is this is going to mess with me if I jump into it. I get that. Logan, um, you've got a couple questions to answer in chat. I'm going to let will. you do that via via typing while I uh, talk about our next story. Uh, first, on a small front, I will say the Xbox Spring Sale is live. A lot of good deals in there. I hope you guys go check that out. I saw uh, Alan Wake 2 being on sale, which is well worth your time. Um, I really enjoyed it. They did like it's something like 800 games discounted. Uh, Baldur's Gate 3, I believe, is on discount. R- masterpieces like uh, Resident Evil 4 and Cyberpunk are on discount as well as a ton of back and pack games. Um, I, there are a few that I'm still on the fence about that I'm just not sure I want to spend the money on uh, here and there. It does amusing. I'm amused when I see games like Suicide Squad there because it has to be, but also, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, don't sleep on some of these games. There's some some really great things out there. Uh, worth your time and money the alan wake uh remake is nine dollars that's a good shout out from cheese works if you guys see your favorites in that summer or that spring sale please let me know and i'll kind of spotlight them as we go uh interesting to see that that kareem chaduri is leaving xbox uh he was one of the xbox 
uh, vice presidents that announced he was leaving Microsoft. This is not necessarily part of their reorganization, though we understand it to be pretty amicable. All things considered, gamers might remember him as the one saying that the Xbox Series X was a monster. Uh, and that was a pretty cool soundbite. I've always really enjoyed Kareem when he's on stage, his presence and such. Um, there is a wider uh, shakeup happening at the Xbox as they kind of retool for the future. We talked about their strategy changing in previous episodes. And it's kind of a bummer to see well-known faces leave. But we've seen a lot of well-known faces leave or change positions. Major Nelson is out there now doing his own thing, which is interesting. Uh, to, to watch. I saw the Iron Lords had him on. He's a tough get as far as an interview, but hey, I'm, I'm trying. Um, it'll be it'll be I keep saying interesting is my word because I really do think it's interesting watching Xbox change leadership strategies going forward. Phil Spencer's been in the role for 10 years at this point, and there are some who would say he, he's failed to deliver because we haven't had that game, that one game that everybody wants to play. I would argue that delivering the massive amount of services, fixing the hardware problem of the Xbox One, bringing back and pat frames, uh, FPS boost, play anywhere, Game Pass, Game Pass Ultimate uh, is, is part of his legacy. The Activision deal is his legacy, and now it's up to Sarah Bond to kind of pave the way. And so seeing Kareem leave, I want to give him all the well wishes in the world. I really did enjoy his work. I, I enjoyed seeing him when we, in, the, in the places that we saw him. Uh, it'll be curious to watch where he goes, you know, and will he be willing to talk about Xbox down the line? Uh, what feedback will he have down the line looking back at his time? So it'll be interesting to say. To say. Yeah. 26 years on one company, man. That's a, a heck of a, it's heck of a stride. I know uh, Robin Beanland, who is the, the 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 musical master over at Rare, just celebrated 30 years at Rare Ltd. And it's it, you know we're going to be seeing more of this. You know, as as industry leaders and and executives start to get closer and closer to that retirement age, we're going to see a lot of like mainstays starting to decide that you know they're they're kind of done with the grind. And, and, you know, there's only so much life that you can live before you have to sit down and, uh, what was it? Samwise over at Blizzard, uh, retired not that long ago. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people were like, what happened? What, what's the conspiracy behind it? Turns out the dude realized that, you know, he was hitting the age that his dad was when his dad passed away and he's sitting here grinding every single day working. And he's like, when am I going to have time to like, enjoy the rest of my life? Right. And that's could be something that he just wants to do. You know, if, if he wants, if Kareem wants to just enjoy the rest of his life, mm -hmm. let's, let's, you know, celebrate that for him. You know, 26 years at Microsoft is a heck of a, a number to be committed. You know, I, I, I think I'm at my job right now for five years and I think that's the longest I've ever been at a job, man. I've been, I, I never stick with a job this long. I'm usually bouncing onto something else to learn a different trade or something like that. By the way, if you have any questions about pest control, I can help you out with that. But there's so <laughs> many things where you just want to sit down and think like, I think I'm good. I think, I think I'm good with, with where I'm at in life. And I think I'm ready to just chill and actually maybe play some of these games. Right. Right. That, that, I hope that's all it is. I hope that's what it is. I want Kareem to be happy. I want anybody to be happy because we've seen so many Industry layoffs, negative stories going around. I mean, Sega just did their own uh, slew of, of of layoffs, and it feels bad because this industry can eat you up and 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 spit you out. You know that's a thing that can happen. And so to see somebody that's been able to stay in one place for twenty some years and be happy deserves to to go more places and and find joy in their workspace. So all the best to him and thank. Let's sincerely say thank you. To Kareem for for bringing so much to the Xbox space because there was a point I truly believe where Xbox could have could have settled in and said all right we tried we did well for a while we missed the mark and we're done and they've not done that they have doubled triple quadrupled down seventy billion dollar down to keep gaming alive in the Xbox division which means Halo and Gears and Forza and Sea of Thieves and Minecraft and Starfield. And now Call of Duty will continue to exist 
in perpetuity and in, in symbiosis to Xbox. And so I'm grateful to the work that's being done there for sure yeah, to everybody definitely. that's making that happen. Logan, we've gotten uh, some listener questions. And chat, if you have a question for us for our Q&A portion, please drop it in there. Um, I think we sort of addressed this one to start, and that was the Lord Sir Master James study asking about pro generation systems in the forecast. What features do we feel are must have for average gamers to invest? Uh, not that folks who eat and breathe games, but casual gamers. I don't think pro systems will sell on features. I think we talked about this kind of already, but games will sell pro systems. The incremental like, improvement of uh, a game that you really want. If you launch a Gears collection and you say it's going to be better on a pro, uh, if you launch uh, a PS5 Pro and you say that Horizon Zero Dawn will play at 120 or something like that, then I think that's the way to that you sell a pro system to casuals because that's just more likely that nobody i don't think people are gonna be like oh well, you can have fps boost now i don't think that does it um i think it's a game that does it mm. i i don't disagree i think games really are like the main driver for consoles if i had to address the question i want to bend it a little bit and not necessarily say that it would be a feature so much as a design choice mm -hmm. and i think if you want to capture average gamers you should try and go where they want to be, which is mobile and mm -hmm. handheld. And I think that if they, if you can offer something like a Series S, uh, albeit a, a stronger Series S with a, a pretty decent battery life, you know, we're talking like five hours. Mm -hmm. I think that you could probably capture a lot larger of an audience um, akin to, you know, like what Nintendo is doing, what Steam is doing with a handheld that offers the full access of an Xbox console in that form factor. Um, I think that is probably where I would, where I would want to see them go. If they, if they're going to try and get the average gamer, like get, get a device out there that's light that has access to all the games that Xbox has in a portable form factor. And I think you'll probably capture a lot more average gamers because I think the Series S is a testament to that $300 price point being a big entry for a lot of new gamers who previously had never owned an Xbox, something that they've touted in the past. That's fair. I I, I can see that one for sure. Uh, Nerd Chat saying battery life is key. Yep, fully agree with that one. Um, let's go with, we have a question from Cheeseworks who is new to XEP. So Again, welcome. Uh, we hope you'll go and check out some of our back catalog. Um, Cheeseworks says, uh, what's the background of both Luke and Logan? I'm new here. Uh, so chat, those of you that have been part of XCP, please welcome them and uh, and let them know kind of what's up. I Logan, I'll let you think on yours. I will say that I've been podcasting for quite a while, Cheeseworks. I, a decade plus ago, had a Major League Soccer podcast that was quite successful. Uh, I interviewed de not developers. I interviewed uh, professional soccer players from all three tiers of professional soccer, general managers from all three tiers, uh, some of the highest level millionaires to play in Major League Soccer, down to the people that were making thirty thousand dollars a year trying in the small leagues. Uh, I did that for a bit. I'm a teacher on the side. I, I'm a pardon me for bumping my mic. Uh, I'm a middle school teacher by trade. Fourteen years in, uh, and we. Logan and I have been podcasting together for a little over a year. I've done this XEP since 2019 and XEP has a focus on developer interviews. I've done 115 plus developer interviews in the history of XEP. So the last four or five years, um, top tier people like Seamus Blackley, the creator and designer of the first Xbox, Ed Freeze, pioneer of Xbox live, Mike Chapman, guy behind sea of thieves, uh, to indie devs that you've probably never heard of. Um, and I really enjoy kind of spotlighting all levels. It's difficult. It's been trying to be a small podcast and get those developers on, but it's a pleasure when we do. And, um, again, you're part of the first live episode. So this is another milestone. So that's kind of my background, Logan. What about you, bud? Uh, so I have been gaming pretty much my whole life. You know, I've been, I've been in and out of different ecosystems, but I subscribe to them all. Uh, heavily an action uh, platformer kind of person, you know, uh, that's kind of my main thing. 
As far as like podcasting goes, um, I make a Sea of Thieves podcast called the Keel Hauled Podcast um, that I started back in February of 2018. Yeah, 2018. And uh, before that was kind of go- guesting on some Nintendo podcasts to kind of like see, you know, how that all felt. Um, I've loved theater. I used to do acting in the in back in the day during community acting and stuff like that used to go to college for it as well uh so for me you know being involved in some sort of content creation is a real dream for me uh luke and some of our friends have all been people that i've been listening to and and trying to uh, share my voice with for a long time um but it's it's one of those things where i kind of hop from job to job but the job that I'm working now is a nice one where I get to work from home. So I get to live in my little office here. And uh, during the weekends, I spend most of my time kind of grinding out podcasts and talking to people and just trying to, to invest or inject uh, questions and thoughts into the industry to try and see, like, where can we push things? Where can we see where consumers can gain uh, some some insight and to help navigate the uh the waters of what companies try to do to us on a regular basis, which, you know, <laughs> Matt Valdez and chat jokes, you know, l- I love legislation. And I, 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 if you, if you come back and you listen to some old episodes or you, you stick around for future ones, you'll probably hear me talk about how I think that legislation is going to be the way that consumers are able to uh, have more control over our media and be able to have companies not be able to take away stuff that is tied to IP or licensed content um, that I know was talked about earlier and how it's, how hard that is to keep that pushed forward for future uh, generations and stuff like love that. I, want, stuff. I want Logan to have his own show on XEP called uh, Logan loves Leg- legislation, but you know, <laughs> he's busy. Um, we had Todd Oxer write in over on threads. Uh, Todd said, what and by the way shout out to todd secret friends unite says what's the most surprising studio xbox acquired is there a studio they that you wish they had i always wish they had bioware especially because of how strong the relationship was during the early xbox era to me the most surprising one was in exile um i did i did not expect them to get in exile because i don't think in exile's ip or work in the gaming space was so like bombastic like compulsion games had that really unique style in exile did not seem to have that for me and next to the obsidian acquisition it felt odd and yet in exile is a fantastic studio i'm really glad they ended up there but it did surprise me um and as far as what studio do i wish they had i wish they had scooped up rocksteady years ago when wb was shopping them Uh, i think rocksteady would have been a fine addition to the portfolio and i think some decisions could have been altered and, and worked around um nether realm being a parallel to that, I w- Nether Realm would have also been a great one uh, to pick up. That's my answer to that one. Man, if they had gotten the Warner Brothers studio, uh, Nether Realm, and uh, Rocksteady, that would have been that would have been impressive. Although mm-hmm. then people would have been like, "Oh, I can't believe! Look at this Suicide Squad Xbox exclusive. Get out of yep. here!" Yeah. Um, for me, I think the biggest surprise was Rare's purchase back mm-hmm. in the day. I think a lot of people seeing Rare move from Nintendo to Microsoft was in a way a betrayal to Donkey Kong and and fans of Donkey Kong um, in Banjo-Kazooie. I think a lot of us grew up on on GoldenEye and Perfect Dark and Mm -hmm. to see those kind of, you know, shift over from you know, content that was never going to ever get released again until this last year or, or, you know, franchises that are going to be under Microsoft now. It was very interesting to kind of see that, that, that change. And uh, I think a lot of people still kind of bitter about the fact that Microsoft owns my uh, rare and that we aren't getting rare based Donkey Kong games anymore. Um, As far as studios that I think I would have loved to have seen, Microsoft actually scoop up. Um, I think Sucker Punch would have been the one that I would have really loved to have seen, like what they could do. Back with... in the Sunset Overdrive time? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Back when Sunset Overdrive was a hit and it just came out, I would have really loved to have seen 
uh, Microsoft really kind of shake hands with them and just scoop them up, give them the full freedom to do whatever they want. I think Sucker Punch has done a fantastic job over at Sony. Um, uh, Rick Davis correctly pointing out that's Insomniac. Oh, did it? I, I knew what you meant, but but yes. Sucker yeah, Punch suck does. Sucker Punch. Oh, yeah, was... yeah, you're right. You're right. That is Insomniac. I don't know yeah. why I'm conflating those two. Um, but yes, uh, Insomniac, I think like looking back at the, you know, in the history of what's happened now, we've seen what what Insomniac can do and and how good they can develop. I think if if they had taken Insomniac when Sunset Overdrive had come out, I think that would have that would have been really a, just a, a, an on level with I would say like Obsidian mm -hmm. um, as far as like a pickup for studios. Yeah, that's a good answer. Uh, that's a, a really good answer, actually. Uh, let's see. We had a question from Rick Davis. He says, if you guys were head of Xbox and you had to make one but only one series exclusive to the Xbox hardware and everything else went day and date elsewhere, what game or series would it be? Mm. Yeah, I... Mm -hmm. Elder Scrolls? I'm gonna read this story again. Let's see. If you could, if you guys were heads of Xbox and you had to make one, but only one series exclusive to Xbox hardware, and everything else went day and day elsewhere, what game or series would it be? <sighs> What's so like the right choice or the one that my gut says Halo? Right, my gut says Halo, but I think Halo needs to adapt to survive because the space is crowded. If you wanted Xbox to be successful. Call of Duty would be it, but you can't yeah. because of the agreements, right? There's a, there's agreements in place, but Call of Duty is the answer. Um, Call mm. of Duty is the answer if you want Xbox consoles and then to be it, but like they're limited on that one. So maybe Elder Scrolls, but I don't know. That's it's a mean question. It's a mean, yeah. Question. If I could, uh, yeah, if I could make and and I mean, we're, we're talking hypothetically right here. Magic wand. Know? It's 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 called it's called duty, right? Like, legislation out of the window. We don't care what the agreements <laughs> were. We're just going to do the whatever we like can God. because I can snap my fingers and make it happen. Call of Duty gets exclusive uh, and everything else goes day and day because I think honestly, like that is the thing that will will 100 percent sell any console because there are just so many fans of Call of Duty that any pride they have will they will suck that up for the casual gamer because they don't care like casual gamers they'll buy and sell whatever console they got they'll go into gamestop they'll trade it in that that'll be the end of it and they'll just go pick up whatever console has call of duty so you put call of duty as a as a series exclusive for hardware i don't care what that console is that console will sell but that's like that's that is the hypothetical like wave the magic wand kind of thing um, if, if I had to do one that I know is already like something that they could do with Elder Scrolls is good. Um, I would say, I would say that they would probably have to create a new IP and I think it would have to be something that really is compelling. And I don't know that we have that yet. Mm -hmm. I think we have potential in things like fable perfect dark and blade but i don't know that we know enough about what those games are going to be like to say that that is something that they could actually do yeah i'm not sold on either or any of those games yeah so far and unfortunately and we, we don't have reason to be they haven't showed no. enough there's no reason to believe that xbox can deliver a god of war caliber game because they've not done that yet yeah uh in this era so to have blade and fable uh south Perfect of midnight work. yeah the, the clockwork revolution contraband to believe that any of those could compete oh, i'm excited for clockwork i really Are want you? that game to be cool i hope it is for your sake bud uh this question again cheeseworks really supporting us this week uh what was the thinking behind switching from pre-recorded to live survivability cheeseworks uh Luke relevant. Is lazy no uh, oh um survivability and and relevance was the most important part, but also connecting to, to listeners was a big problem because Twitter is dying threads. I exist in threads. I love threads. I use it, but Twitter was dying. We have an incredible Patreon uh, exclusive membership, and I need to look into how to get 
channel memberships to be into our, pay, our our Discord. But we have a wonderfully supportive community there. It's just absolutely incredible support in our Discord. But that means connecting with fewer people. And because it's Patreon membership locked, everybody's very positive and kind. Nobody's there for console war BS. We don't need to mute anybody. Nobody's unaccepting of others. So that's the best part. But it made it difficult to reach people and to have these interactions. So that was part of it. And then the other part, to, to Logan's point, it's not laziness, but I do not enjoy editing production. It was taking up my entire Saturday as opposed to a two-hour window. So doing it in StreamYards lets me have this time here. And once we're done, I hit end stream. All I have to do is put the audio files up for audio listeners, and I'm done. And so that really lets me have my weekends back because I – just wasn't seeing my family the way I wanted to. So being live really allows for a lot of ways to expand the show and not suffer. Um, there's no editing, then render, then upload, then let it process. It's not happening that way. So that was the idea. And it was an expensive switch, which is, uh, I, I made no hidden elements to that. I'm so grateful to our patrons and then so many people today that took the time to be members and super chat and stuff because that's really helpful. And we would like to go to LA this summer and uh, see people at Game Fest or Fan Fest or whatever it might be. And and regardless, I'm grateful. So um, there you go. I had to throw around mod powers earlier. Uh, I mute that jerk. Didn't really want him to be in here, but he insists on being a jerk. Uh, that's Rick Davis. Yes, that's and Rick's been an incredible supporter of XCP since day one as a patron in our discord. That's why you're a mod and we don't we have no time for people being cruel about PlayStation or Xbox or Nintendo. We are gamers. And so uh, that is, is how we do it. Um, Silent Cypher says podcasting take can take a lot of time away very fast. You're absolutely right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. <laughs> um, I do, do we have any other questions that I missed, Logan, or anything in there that I have not had a chance to spotlight um, while you're doing that? I'll say. While you're looking uh, behind me, I will say that Ellery Woods Parker III, one of our community members, is doing a community review for us on a game called Outer Terror. Uh, anxious to read what they write. Um, they also kind of do support for Complete Xbox, which is a um, an enthusiast site as well. Just put up the Tales of Iron developer interview last uh, yesterday with Jack Bennett. Of course, 115 plus developer interviews on XCP. Please go check them out. Some from from big and small. We'd really appreciate you guys checking those out uh, as well. Logan, did you see any in there that we might have missed? I don't think. No, I think we're good. Okay, okay. I'm checking our Discord, making sure I don't miss any questions for the show. There. Did you get this last one? How did, How did uh, we meet and start working together? We met via. Um, I reached out to you uh, a couple of years ago. And and was like feeding you thoughts and feelings through Twitter DMs. Okay. And I think that was kind of like me just kind of chatting with you. And I I can't remember if we I'm I can't remember if we really I, I think it was at one point because I was making an Xbox podcast and I was failing at it because I was not happy with the content that I was making. So I decided to kill mine off. And then I think you reached out to me to see if I'd be interested in uh, jumping on XEP to help out with kind of the workload of, of like getting notes together and talking about stuff and just helping kind of having a conversation around the show. Um, that, yes, I am remembering that now that you say that. Yeah, the Xbox wrap up was your Xbox show that that you, you laid to rest, but that rebirthed in our Patreon exclusive show. We have yeah. a, for, for, patrons and i need to again investigate channel membership comparison numbers uh but we have a patreon exclusive show called the xbox wrap up where anybody that's a supporter of the show can join and talk about their games from the month and we do that once a month and it's a blast um wrap up kind of became as an homage to, to your former project right yeah yeah pretty much now and that was I, I I've always wanted to have a space outside of my Sea of Thieves podcast to be able to talk about Xbox news because that was where that's where I live, and it's it is extremely hard to run two shows solo. Um, it's it's still hard to have two shows, but it's one of those things where I still had a lot of passion uh, for the industry and I wanted to get that out there. So Luke has been 
awesome enough to be able to let me have that space uh, without as much commitment to just doing like a solo show and going live is going to help kind of lighten the load for both of us. Um, mostly on his part because I, he's, he still keeps up a lot of that. It's true. Uh, I want to thank Rick Davis for his compliment. Yeah. I used to do the show solo cheese works. It was a solo show that existed just me reading and having guests on developers, people uh, from around the industry. And then Logan helped me really up my game because it's really hard to do a solo show. I don't yeah. necessarily enjoy the production taking my whole weekend. And so Logan stepping in really gave it new life. And in doing so discovered a great friend and now we, um, now we get to exist and, and play games and, and whatnot. Well, so the fact that you and I have gotten to become really good friends because this podcast has been an exponential boon to my life, to be perfectly honest. Now I'm not trying to like, this isn't me gussing it up for for the sake of like us being live or anything like that. Like genuinely, like the last week has been really tough for me mentally and physically. Luke has been a good friend and and a genuinely like good human being, and and it it wouldn't have existed without this show. So I I, I appreciate just like everyone being here, but I really appreciate that that the show just even exists. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. That is, I get a little choked up. So that's cool. That's cool. It's been a good day. Um, uh, who's Batman? Who's Robin? Asks the nerd chat. I, I am so offended if I'm not Batman. I'm in the Batman chair, which nobody can kind of tell. Or in the super. Come on now. Come on. Uh, I'll, man, I'll take Robin if right. If it's the Robin that turns into Nightwing. Oh, yeah. Dick Grayson's a great character. God, I love Nightwing. Loved it. So, yeah. Yeah. Play God Knight. Say that live. <laughs> Somebody clip it. Um, <laughs> Somebody we end the show now. I suppose so. Well, uh, Logan, <laughs> let people know where they can find you on socials and what you've got cooking for Sea of Thieves because people may not know about your keel hold. Yo, Matt Valdez. Oh, Matt good. Valdez. Good distraction. Thank you so much for the, the $50 roughly to, to uh, Super Chat coming out. Congrats on the first live show. Would love to see more crossover appearances with the Nerd Chat in the future. I'm always down for that because we I got that uh, we got that that fantasy league going. We got to yeah. figure out. I don't I don't know if we're going to actually be able to do anything about that, but we got that fantasy league going. Loves having you guys in in uh, in the sh in the uh, chat as well too. So thank you so much. Big time. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Ten times over, man, because that really helps the switch. So I'm I'm grateful to you uh, for that. That beyond, I don't know what to say. So th thank you, fifty dollars super chat. Uh, truly truly honored to have you man um yeah wow wow um i will plug logan's show for him he hosts a show called keel hauled podcast which is an uh sea of thieves dedicated show uh the now multi-platform sea of thieves which is uh fantastic to see because i think they'll give that show new life um it's truly well done and well made and so i'm really hoping people you. check that out uh for sure uh, you can find Logan on socials at capped underscore Logan. Uh, check him out on threads. Check him out on Twitter. Uh, and of course, anyone that's a member of our discord, we really do interact a lot there. Uh, we do need to have a game night or two with some of our people. I think it's time. Mm. Uh, we need to, to game up with some of our people um, for sure. Uh, we play a lot of different games, guys, from Helldivers 2 to, to Halo to COD. We never play Battlefield because that game's not good. Um you guys can find me on socials at Insipid Ghost, but I really want to say that uh, we are honored for those of you that have chosen to show up for our live show. Uh, if you dropped a like, a subscribe, or even a super chat or a channel membership, or you're a patron, we appreciate you so much. Thank you guys for helping make this switch uh, what it is and for doing uh, everything you can to make XEP a great place for gamers uh, and supporters. We greatly appreciate you all logan do you have any closing comments for us no just thank you for everyone that showed up if you guys get a chance there's three likes on the video if you could bump that up a bit i definitely would appreciate hit, it love hit it. reload hit reload we're up to 26 <laughs> 28 there oh, we are go. we yeah yeah hit reload oh, it doesn't live up the down. oh my god so <laughs> all righty guys. whatever i said <laughs> That is going to be it for us. I'm going to see if I can't get this outro and then you'll see some <laughs> Patreon supporters. Have a great rest of your week. Take care. Bye.